Welcome to this series on the brain. We'll start by looking at the brain and dividing it up structurally into different structural areas. In general, this large superior part of the brain is the cerebrum, and in the back, this is the cerebellum. We see that the cerebrum is made up of all of these folds of the neural cortex. Each of these raised portions is a gyrus. Each of the little creases is a sulci. We see that we have some very, very deep creases. Okay, this one right here down the very center of the cerebrum is called the longitudinal fissure. The longitudinal fissure divides the cerebrum into left and right hemispheres or halves. If we look around the back of the brain, we have a transverse fissure. The transverse fissure separates the cerebellum from the cerebrum. We have some sulci or some grooves that are rather dominant sulci, and they divide the brain up into sections called lobes. If we look inside the brain, we have an inner lobe called the insula. The insula. You can see it shown in orange right here, and it curves all the way back. Insula literally means island of cortex. Okay, because it's an island of cortex that lies deeper within the brain. If we look at the very center of the cerebrum, we have the central solstice. The central solstice divides the frontal lobe here in the front from the parietal lobe. If we look at the back of the skull here, we have a parietal occipital solstice that actually comes in and curves around the medial side of the brain. Okay, so it's not shown well here. The parietal occipital solstice separates the parietal lobe from the occipital lobe in the very bottom back of the brain. Finally, when we look at the side of the brain, we have a lateral solstice right here, okay, extending laterally. The lateral solstice separates the temporal lobe, okay, the temporal lobe from the frontal lobe. You'll notice that each of these lobes is named for the bone that covers it, okay, the skull bone that lies on top of it. So again, the frontal lobe is under the frontal bone, parietal lobe under the parietal bone, occipital lobe under the occipital bone, and the temporal lobe on either side underneath the temporal bone. The only one that's different is the insula that we said was deeper inside. We can also name these two prominent gyri that are right in front and in back of the central solstice. So we said that this groove right here is the central solstice. Okay, this raised gyrus in front of it is called the precentral gyrus. Precentral, it's in front of the central solstice. This raised portion behind it is the post-central gyrus. Okay, it's post-central, behind the central solstice. So when we divide the brain up functionally, we see that we have different areas of the brain that handle different types of stimuli or send different types of instructions out to the body. For each of these functional regions, we see that we have a primary area and an association area. So right in front of the central solstice, okay, this precentral gyrus is the primary motor cortex, the primary motor cortex that sends signals out to muscles to contract. This general area right in front of that is the premotor area or the motor association area where we plan those contractions. If we go behind the central solstice, this purple area right here is showing us the primary somatosensory cortex. Okay, that's where we receive information about our general senses, like touch, pain, pressure, vibration. Right behind the primary somatosensory cortex, we have the somatosensory association area, where we interpret and make sense of those signals. If we go around to the very back of the brain, this green area right here is showing us the primary visual cortex. 
That's where we receive signals about what it is we're seeing, what color, what size, how much light. Around that in yellow, you see the visual association area. That's where we can recognize and make sense of what it is that we're seeing. If we go to the side of the brain here in the temporal lobe, this gyrus right here is showing us the primary auditory cortex where hearing signals come in. And then here it's showing us the auditory association area, okay, where we make sense of those signals. The last two areas, right here in blue, we see the motor speech cortex, also called Broca's area, okay, Broca's area. This is where we control our complex um, movements that result in our speech. Finally, the very front of the frontal lobe here is called the prefrontal cortex. And that prefrontal cortex is essentially what makes us human. Okay, this area is only developed in primates and it's only very well developed in humans. This prefrontal cortex is where we have our personality, where we come up with our decision-making abilities, um, where we understand our place in the world. So if we look inside the brain, we see any number of other structures. We'll start right here by looking at the diencephalon. Remember the diencephalon includes the thalamus and hypothalamus as the major structures. Okay, this round area right here is showing us the thalamus. Remember that we have a right and left thalamus. They're connected to each other at this dot here called the massa intermedia. Underneath the thalamus, we have the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus has a major endocrine gland hanging off of it right here called the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus via this stalk called the infundibulum. If we go right in front of the pituitary gland, this little white bulge right here is showing you the optic chiasm. That's where the optic nerves from the eyes come in and meet the brain. If we go right behind the pituitary gland, this little white bulge right here is showing you a mammillary body. We have two mammillary bodies that hang off underneath um, the midbrain. If we go around the back of the thalamus, we have another gland that sticks off here. This gland is called the pineal gland, where we release melatonin to control our sleep cycles. If we look above the thalamus, we see these projections right here that include white matter, okay, or myelinated axons. This large projection right here is called the corpus callosum, okay, and those are fibers that connect the left and right hemisphere. Underneath, this is showing us the fornix. Okay, this depression in between the two is showing us the lateral ventricle. If we go down further, we see the fourth ventricle down here towards the bottom of the brain. And we see this little tube leading down to the fourth ventricle, which is called the cerebral aqueduct. Looking down at the brain stem, Okay, we see that this top part of the brain stem here is the midbrain, the midbrain. Underneath the midbrain, this bulge is the pons, and the bottom of the brain stem is the medulla oblongata, and that connects to the spinal cord. If we go back from the midbrain, we see these two little bulges here, and these are actually little groups of gray matter. This top one is the superior colliculus, and the bottom one is the inferior colliculus. If we look back here at the cerebellum, we see that the cerebellum, the outer cortex, is also very folded. In this case, the folds are called folia. In the center, we see this white matter here that's in the shape of a tree. We call that the arbor vitae, or the tree of life. Around the outside of the brain, we see the meninges, okay, the connective tissue layers that surround and protect the brain.
Looking at this model here, we can see the ventricles more clearly. Remember that the brain has four ventricles or interior chambers, and we produce cerebrospinal fluid in those ventricles, and it circulates through the ventricles and then eventually around the outer surfaces of the brain. These two large areas here are called the lateral ventricles. The lateral ventricles go down to the third ventricle. Okay, so this area down here is showing us the third ventricle. Down here at the bottom, we see the fourth ventricle. So the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, the fourth ventricle. Right here, where the lateral ventricles go down into the third ventricle, we have a little hole called the interventricular foramen. Down here, this tube that leads from the third to the fourth ventricle is called the cerebral aqueduct. The cerebral aqueduct. Looking at the underside of this model right here, we can see the cranial nerves. We have 12 pairs of cranial nerves that carry signals to and from the brain. Starting at the top here, we have the olfactory bulbs, and these receive information from cranial nerve one. Going down, we have cranial nerve two. If we extend deep in the pons over here, we'll see cranial nerve three. Extending outward, cranial nerve four and down on either side of the center of the pons here, we have cranial nerve five. Then if we come down to the bottom of the pons, we'll work our way from the inside to the outside. And we have cranial nerves six, cranial nerve seven, and cranial nerve eight. From there, we work our way down. We have cranial nerve nine, 10, and 11. And then in here is cranial nerve 12. When we talk about the cranial nerves and their functions, we can break them up into cranial nerves that have sensory functions, cranial nerves that have motor functions, and cranial nerves that have both. If you start from cranial nerve one and work your way down to cranial nerve 12, there's a saying that can help you remember if the cranial nerve is sensory, motor, or both. The saying is, some say marry money, but my brother says bad business to marry money. Okay? And the first letter of each word corresponds with whether or not the cranial nerve is a sensory nerve, a motor nerve, or B for both. Thank you very much. Please post any questions that you may have.